This is the Frank and Friends Show. Hi there, I'm Frank Murphy. And I am Mitch Moore. Mitch Moore, the famous actor that I've talked about on this podcast repeatedly? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for finally, I mean, finally, thank you me for finally getting my act together and having you on the show, as promised. Yeah. But... Because we'll explain all of that. We're having, uh, my wife and I are having dinner at this restaurant in um, Sevierville. Yep. An Italian restaurant. It was nice. Yeah. And I saw you there. Yes. And you and your wife were having a meal and we chatted. Right. And I, I, we got in the conversation of, oh, you should come on the podcast. Yeah. Well, I, I've only done like, I don't know, a handful of shows and uh, since then. And on one of the days I filmed two. So I think I've probably done maybe four episodes since, maybe five episodes since that moment. And I thought, but I felt bad because that was three months ago. Right. So I've, I've been feeling racked with guilt, but I'm glad you're here. Thank you for, well, we saw each other again right. at, an event, at a concert. My wife had a concert, the Knoxville Choral Society. We have one of those um, relationships where we, we always just run into each other yes. in public. We don't even have each other's phone numbers. <laughs> we just wait until we see each other and then make plans. <laughs> we'll, we'll finish a story two months later. Oh, yeah, when I was telling you two months ago when I saw you at the... But uh, you know, I think we had our wires crossed a little bit. Well, it was me. I had mine crossed because I didn't do enough shows. And I was thinking, I should call Mitch. I should call Mitch. Uh, but also, I'm as you saw from watching... It's easier for me when Sarah Roberto or Freddy or anybody says, hey, I'm going to be available these days. Right. And that's where that's what you mean by wires. Cross, right. right? The, the ball was in my court to some degree and I didn't follow up. And, and I thought, you know, Frank hated me. Plus, you know, so. Which is all right. So then we have a lot in common. <laughs> Because <laughs> I assume when I don't hear from people that they hate me. So, uh, and they don't, and uh, I don't. Of course not. Of so, course not. What, a, what a relief. Yeah. I'm sweating over here. Uh, a am I your first male co host? No. Okay. But it's been a while. Okay. Um, I don't know if you remember uh, Tim Coleman, who was at Sweet Fanny Adams. I never saw him on this show, but I, t this is a, uh, when I first moved to East Tennessee. This was 1991. Mm -hmm. And uh, my wife um, at the time, I'll, let's just leave it at that, um, uh, had a job. And through that job, I met Tim Coleman. Tim Coleman is one of the first people I met in East Tennessee. That's outstanding. Yeah. Well, I, he, if there were someone who had to be the welcoming ambassador, if you, we had to pick a guy <laughs> to, to take all the newcomers and shake their hand right. and sit, pat them on the back and say, come on in, I think I would nominate Tim Coleman. He would be appropriate for that. And, and if you went up to Tim today and said, oh, I did a, a show with Mitch Moore, he'd go, I have no idea who that is. He, uh, he, won't, run, he won't remember uh, me. But. I don't know, because uh, you're in a lot of uh, local theater productions, and we'll get to that in a second. And so is Tim. But Tim also attends... I see him more now in the audience at shows than in the shows. I mean, granted, he's doing a lot over with um, Encore Theatrical in Morristown, so I don't always get to Morristown. But I, I'll be, I bet you he would remember you and I would know who you are. He might. Now, meanwhile, uh, we would love for you to subscribe to this YouTube channel. And I have to explain, I didn't know that people didn't grasp the concept of subscribing on YouTube. But I'm at a nice event. I'm sitting next to this doctor. He's much fancier than me, right? I don't know, I'm lucky to be at the table. I'm just there. You know, local DJ sits at table with uh, fancy people. And I'm trying to explain to the guy that I've got this YouTube channel and he's interested. He's like, I also well, I often watch YouTube. And I said, well, it's hard to get a subscription to people to subscribe to your YouTube channel. I said, well, how much does it cost? I'm like, well, doctor, um, <laughs> it doesn't cost anything, but you said it's, you have to subscribe. That's what, that means you have to pay. <laughs> I'm like, well, yes, the word subscribe does imply that you're paying something, but in YouTube, they just use it as a means of saying follow, right. like, you know, and on Facebook, you'd like it. On Instagram, you would follow it. And on, on YouTube, you click the subscribe button at no charge, doctor. Free. <laughs> Free. Yeah. So I, I, that was the first I've heard that because I, you know, it's, I don't know, some people, they get a zillion subscribers right away. Some of us don't, and we, it's a struggle. But it's a, it's a numbers game, uh, as you know, and getting a, over a certain number means something in YouTube land. And if you can help me get over that number, I would appreciate it. You should have told them it's like Netflix, send you $10 a month, give them your Venmo. Oh, you, you had that up. He's a doctor, Frank. The guy could afford 10 bucks a month for the you know, Frank and, he, and Friends. And he obviously had paid, we were at a, a fundraising event. And of course, I get you know in for free because I had done something. And here he must have paid the $150 a ticket to get in there. What an idiot I am. <laughs> 
Should have thought that one through. <laughs> Should have thought that one through. Well, well we also have uh, fantastic merchandise. Um, now, I'm waiting for my new uh, sweatshirt to arrive. I checked on it. It's, it's being printed. But I love hold, showing up the, uh, the beach towel. Oh, yeah. I've the seen uh, that. Frank and Friends. It gets real. That is cool. I know. You would think uh, it looks like CGI yeah. on the show. But uh, here it is right there. No green screen involved. It's an actual beach towel. But the exciting news is you've got uh, the Frank and Friends coffee mug. I am currently using my Marshmallow Peeps uh, coffee mug because, you know, this is a Peep-centric program. <laughs> But you're the only person that has ever used the word peep centric. Oh, oh I'll, bet. I'll, I'll put I'll that bet. on my anyway. put that on my Wikipedia page. Yeah. But uh, the other day, I got this in the mail, and I was so I didn't even want to open it. I wanted to open it, unbox it on the show because I've never seen packaging material like this for the brand new. Oh wow! Uh, well, bra brand new Frank and Friends show uh, coffee mug to replace the one that got broken, and uh, it should be the same. I might be a little. Newer looking than that one, because this one obviously has never been washed. But there we go. Look at that. Yeah, that okay. looks pretty good, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that one a little, well, I don't know. They print them one at a time, so they, you know, they might look a little different. But that So when you said a new mug, I, I was thinking you meant a, a new design or a whole, oh. like, you meant literally just no, another mug. Yeah, because I had two. Okay. Broke one. Now, I'm sorry that the pint glasses aren't here yet, because I'm, <laughs> I'm probably saving those for when Catherine Frady is here, because we'll do some day drinking and have hard cider in the pint glass. But uh, I guess since I'm not going to, I haven't washed this yet, I'll put it over here with Mo and uh, just let that sit. Mo shouldn't bother you, I don't okay, think. Okay, yeah. He, He's uh, pretty quiet. <laughs> I had him on one episode, and I got comments from this, especially this viewer named Renee, who loves watching for Mo, and uh, so he's a permanent addition now to the program. When my grandchildren come, I wrap him up in a towel, and I put him up there on top of a cabinet, sure, or I hide sure. him somewhere. Um, but I made the mistake of leaving a mug there with old Mo, and in the course of resetting the room for something, um, the mug fell and broke on the uh, on the green screen that looks like my fireplace. So I actually, this is a real <laughs> fireplace. I I told Frank. I this thought is, makes me so happy. I thought it was probably a green screen. It's so, of a fireplace, but it's an actual fireplace. Isn't that fantastic? I've got a, a fireplace that looks so good. It looks fake. <laughs> <laughs> that made my day. That absolutely made my day. That was meant to be a compliment, but it somehow... <laughs> I take it as one. It somehow turned into be something else. No, I, I, I accept the compliment. I'm, I mean, I'm, okay. I've got, I, I think it's... A, look at this. I've got this little place in my house yes. that my wife lets me do a show with my friends, and uh, she'll even... I forgot to ask her, but she'll even put out fresh tablecloths for us because it's, I should have switched the... Uh, this is the January-February cloth. I probably should have switched out to a March-April Okay. But maybe for the next episode, we'll go to the, uh, the Easter yellow or the gold or some other uh, beautiful uh, color. Um, all right. But it is that time of year. It's spring. So how are you, now that we're into daylight saving yes. time? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Just thank you. A one S in saving. It's not, it's not savings time. Uh -uh, uh -uh, it, uh -uh. There's not a sale nope. on time. Nope. We are, you okay. are, I don't even think we are saving time because we lose an hour. I don't see how we're saving anything. But the name of it is Daylight Saving Time yep. with one S in saving. And I had a friend, um, I have a friend who was on the radio in Los Angeles for years, and that was his campaign. He had T-shirts. There's one S in oh saving. And he's given up. He's retired from it now because he's moving to England where they have British summertime. So... People seem to be able to pronounce that properly. They don't seem to have a trouble with, uh, you know, they don't call it British summer's time. Although if you want to get on my friend Bean's nerves, maybe write to him and say, hey, how's British summer's time? <laughs> but he made that his campaign. And I, but I also, like you, I didn't need to be convinced. I was been, I've been in it from day one. Yep. yep I've been yep, a believer yep. all along. And uh, in fact, it, it was a trip, a business trip with my friend Bean um, that was my best time change ever. So it was this time of year, it was spring, and we were working in Los Angeles, but we we're going to do a weekend broadcast from Lake Havasu City. For, it was spring break, right? So we drive from L.A. over to Arizona to Lake Havasu City. Now, Arizona um, is in mountain time normally, but they don't observe daylight saving time. So on Friday, we drive, Friday morning, we finish the show at 10 a.m. at K-Rock, drive to Arizona. We immediately set our clocks forward an hour at whatever time we got to Arizona. So let's say noon, one, two o'clock, whatever time, hour time it was. And now we're now 
on Mountain Time for the whole weekend. So Friday night, we're out doing stuff. Saturday, we're working and doing broadcasting. And then Saturday night, Sunday morning, the rest of the world, not Arizona, jumps ahead an hour to daylight saving time. Okay. So now California is on the same time as Arizona. Arizona is in Mountain Time during the winter, and it's in Pacific Time during the summer. So now we go back to California, and everyone else is complaining about the time change, which we had experienced 48 hours earlier. Right. And we were fine. So that's part of my, that's my, my moral of the story is maybe we should jump ahead on, I don't know, Friday night instead of Saturday night. Give us a little extra day there. You right, know? right. Or yeah. personally, if you can change, if you don't have much to do on a Saturday, it's too late now. I mean, because you have to wait another year to this to happen. But um, get jump, get the jump on it. You know, do it early. Uh, I think they're going to probably at some point leave us stuck on daylight saving time year round. I wish they would just just pick one. I, yeah. I, I could I could get happy with either. But let's just keep it. But all if they year. pick daylight saving time as the permanent, yeah, won't, I, won't the yeah. sundials always be wrong? Oh, but yeah, I mean, who who cares? <laughs> <laughs> Who cares? Huh? You don't have a sundial? Yeah, well, I was thinking anymore. about getting a sundial. Not anymore. Maybe they'll be discounted, you know, because they'll always be wrong. Right, right, right. Or, or you'll have to get, they'll have to redo all the sundials. Can you imagine explaining that <laughs> to the ancient Phoenicians or whoever came up with sundials? Yeah, in the future, we're going to take your idea for the sundial, <laughs> but we're going to re- we're going to change the numbers so that they don't make they're wrong to you. You know, we have to we have to make new sundials so that where it says twelve, it says one, and so on around the clock. I guess that's what you could do. You just take your sundial. I don't know. Pain in the neck. Well, I was thinking about changing the clocks, and I looked around the house, and there a, was a clock radio in the upper uh, guest room. So I don't go in there that much, obviously. Um, and I thought, oh, I better change that one if I look at it. And it's already on daylight saving time from last year. We never had uh, set it back. All right. So that one was done. And then everything else <laughs> is automatic. You know, the phone changes itself. Right, right. Um, the, all the computers change themselves. The Amazon Echoes change themselves. My car changes itself because it plugs into my phone. So it gets the information from the phone and it, I don't have to do that. The only two clocks that I own in the Hell House that I had to change were the one on the oven and the one on the microwave. Right, right. Now, if you look over there, Mitch, you see where I do my radio work? Yeah. Can you, can you imagine the two clocks that I'm looking at all day are the two, <laughs> <laughs> the two least accurate, right. most difficult to change. And you're in a constant just state of panic right, all day. I, the whole job revolves around time. You know, what time do I have to send the, the voice tracks in? What time do I have to, am I on? What time do I have to do that? So I guess, uh, I mean, I guess eventually I'll get a fancier oven maybe or a new microwave that will be a, on the Internet of Things. A smart a, microwave. I mean, I guess. I don't know. I mean, do I really want... Um, Jeff Bezos or whomever to know what I'm microwaving. Oh, he already he already knows, Frank. He already knows, oh. Frank. I mean, yeah. For sure. Je- Jeff Bezos knows. He knows it he all. He knows everything. Well, I mean, I do have lots of those Amazon Echoes around the house, and I know they do listen. Yeah. I think on the last episode, or maybe it was two episodes ago, I was explaining how uh, my wife goes to talk to the uh, the Alexa machine, and her iPhone answered. No, I, I heard you call. I'm Siri, not Alexa. Did you mean to talk to me? Like. Is that creepy? <laughs> I mean, I never imagined that they were in some kind of, you know. This is step one of battle. the machines taking over. They this is, this is what over. we're living through. Yeah. Well, my wife um, is, you know, she's pretty technically savvy, too. So she's got her AirPods. I mentioned a couple episodes ago that we lost one of her AirPods up in Northern Virginia. But we went to the store, and you can buy one AirPod. Did you say, which one do you need, the left or the right? Hmm. And, you know, so they bring out a, just a box with just a left AirPod and, you know, do a couple little magic tricks and, and they're paired and they work fine now. So she'll keep those in, but I can't see them because of her hair. So I, I will be talking to her sometimes and she'll be listening to music or a podcast or she'll be maybe on, doing some other thing and I'm unaware. And she'll be, <laughs> uh, she uses them when she's on the phone, but she also works at an office and she'll call me and she'll say, we're talking about, what are we going to send uh, grandson Timmy for his birthday or whatever other thing, some family business. And she'll say, hold on, I have another call. But she's, on, so I'm on the AirPod. She's got one, me on one AirPod. And then she <laughs> answers the other phone. You know, hello, job, Jerry speaking. And she'll say, what's that? I can't, 
Hello, I can't hear you. Speak up. Are you still there? And I'm like, yeah, I'm still here. Not you, her. <laughs> <laughs> this, this conversation <laughs> going back and forth where she's talking to, talking to me. That's great. Or not talking to me. All right. So a couple of things we need to, uh, we need to get to, and I kind of wanted to get all that you know, time changey stuff out of the way because otherwise I would forget and I'd have to save it for a year. But um, we talked about how we've crossed paths recently, right, multiple times at my wife's concert and at just a random restaurant where we were taking my uh, brother-in-law and sister-in-law for dinner. But you, I, we've crossed paths because of your acting and because of your filmmaking. Now, I used to be in, I mean, plays that I had seen at, well, I used to be, I mean, used to be in shows at Flying Anvil Theater, and that's right, closed. Right, What are you doing now? Well, my, my main gig, you know, you and I were talking about how we're, we're 1099 yeah. oh, people yeah. at tax time, and um, my main gig for the past 25 years has been a, as a freelance writer. Okay, because I think of you as a musician and an actor. I guess writing fits in with all that. Right, writing has been the bread and butter. Okay. That, that's what puts the... Uh, yeah. The bread and butter. <laughs> is that where that came from? <laughs> <laughs> Writing is what puts the food on the table. What kind of butter do you like? We like the Irish butter. I, I like real... What's Irish butter? I've never... I will make you eat some Irish butter. Would you like is some it now? A, got a little... Uh... No, no. It's just... It's these Irish cows. That it's grass-fed. It's bright yellow. But it's delicious. Okay, wow. That sounds it's, great. It's a better butter, is what I'm telling you. Okay. But all right, I'll move I, on. I believe you. Right. Um but uh, I, I have done, I have supplemented uh, my writing career with uh, different things over the years, yeah. uh, uh, video production yeah. slash filmmaking. Um, I'm in a band, you know, it's just more of a fun. And the band has a clever 80s pun name. The name of our band is Vinyl Tap. Come on. Huh? Come on. Is that, that's, that's good. Does it go to 11 that's really, is the big question. It, it, that, yeah, so we, we <laughs> yeah, louder if possible. <laughs> And, uh, and yeah, and I've also, um, over the years, done quite a bit of acting on stage. Which is where I mainly know you from, because I've seen you in multiple shows. Right. And now, here's the thing. That's how you know me. I, I know you. Nobody. What? I know you. I knew you from before you knew me, because when, when did you come to Knoxville? The 90s? Um, early 2000s. Early 2000s. 2002. Okay. So it's uh, 20. Two years now. So back in those days, I was still listening to the radio, and I was mm-hmm. actually listening to WIMZ until I got yeah. sick of the seven songs that they play. But they're good songs. I know, I know. It's just it got it got repetitive. One of them is me. very long. So, he- <laughs> but you you had come to town. You were co-hosting the morning show with Phil Williams, who was well known for his yeah, previous yeah. gig at WIMZ, and now was on uh, WOKI, which was at the time one hundred point three, The River. But I, I, I really I liked your addition to that show because oh, WIMZ has hey, it's sort of a blue collar yeah. uh, vibe to it, and and you brought some dignity and humor that I that I thought was a nice compliment. Not that Phil Williams d- doesn't have dignity, but no, no. But, but you're, what you're describing is the guy in California, the consultant in California, who uh, who I knew and had worked, helped. I had been. Um, known him for several years. He says to me, hey, I got this client station in Tennessee and they are going to do an odd couple type show. Oh, so we're well, looking for somebody who is the opposite yes. of this local legend who they have. So I'm not local and I'm not a legend. So I was the opposite. Yeah. Uh, you know, Phil, the odd, you know, the odd couple to Phil Williams. Yeah, that, that was a, that was, br- uh, br- if that's what they were trying to do, mm-hmm. they achieved it. So there you go. So that's how I knew Frank. And, and then ah. we started the whole Kind of knowing who each other were and yeah. running into each other, and, and we had mutual friends from the acting world. I would meet yeah. other actors and right. people who were in shows with you. And then after the, uh, especially at Flying Anvil, they used to always have receptions after opening nights. Right, so I remember sh- you coming to see shake hands uh, with everybody. Did you see the Thanksgiving play? Yes, or, and you saw Sylvia. I saw the dog show. Those are the only two shows I ever did. Well, I saw um, both of them, which is why it seems like I've seen you in there. <laughs> <laughs> And that, so, but you've done uh, any other theaters around town? I have. I, I've, and this is what I started to say a minute ago. Since the pandemic, I've really put acting on the back burner. Okay. Uh, I used to have an agent. I, I mean, I was going to Atlanta and Nashville oh, for auditions. And, wow. And I'm auditioning for like national TV shows, not getting booked on any of yeah. them, but auditioning. And, um, but the pandemic really put a, a damper yeah. on that. So, and since then, I've kind of discovered I don't miss all that grind of an actor. Ah. I've really enjoyed stepping away from that. Um, I, I, I liked 
doing, I, I don't do much stage work anymore. Okay. And, and the reason I did Flying Anvils because it was a semi-professional. They yeah. paid their actors. Right, right. Uh, uh, most theater in this market, as you well know, is community theater. It's all volunteer. And to me, I, it's not that I don't enjoy it. It's a big time commitment. Are we talking like Oak Ridge and Theater Oak Ridge, Knoxville Theater Knoxville downtown. downtown, all fine Those companies. Are vo you volunteer if you're in the show. Right, right. You you don't get you do it just for the love of doing it. Mm -hmm. And and I like doing it. But at this phase of my life, I I, I just choose to spend my time. It makes sense to me. Doing other things. So. It makes sense to me. I, I'm amused and interested in those things. And if I, I mean, I, I don't know, I could probably do it. I've never memorized that many lines because I'm an improviser more right. than a, you know, memorizer. But um, I've always had that, that, oh, man, that looks like fun. I could get up there with, the, with Dave Snow as Hercule Poirot. Yeah, yeah look at that. You know. No, that's, that's funny. I, I did want to talk to you about improv. Well, let's talk about that. And I want to talk to you about your... Uh, short-lived, I think. How many YouTube well, shows that it, I loved? Yes, it was um, over a period. We did 10 episodes in about a year. All right. Well, I want to talk about that, too. But also, I, I, before I get to, now that I'm at the mid-roll of the podcast, it's time to talk about Death and Decay and Dr. Bill Bass and BoneZones.com. Don't forget the S. Because if you do, I, I, I never tried it. I'm never going to put it in my search history, but you can if you want. <laughs> I was trying to say, what happened? Have you ever gone to Bone Zone? You Singular. Know, that started as a joke. I was emceeing an event for Dr. Bass, and I was just saying it. And I, I don't, it, just, it just came out. I improvised the line once, and now, now I've made it a non, you know, I say it every time as a, on purpose. But um, it got, because it got a laugh that first time. So I'm like, well, I'll always remember that. Well, anyway, you can get all these great books. Uh, that are listed on the back of the shirt. You can get the actual shirt. They have a bunch of orange shirts. If you need, uh, if you want to root on the Vols in the um, NCAA tournament, you can do that. Uh, I've got mostly the darker colored oh, stuff. The that, hat is cool. The, yeah, you can the hat is cool. Hold that up. And then we've got um, the actual books that um, that he wrote with John Jefferson, uh, like the fiction series, which are Jefferson Bass, the nonfiction series, like Death's Acre. So you can check those out. Um, you can also hire me to come do a presentation about the body farm, and I'll play clips of interviews that I have with Dr. Bass and show some of his forensic slides. Like the one, the basic one I do about the history of the body farm, we have um, a case study. I think they use the same guy in a museum exhibit at the McClung Museum one year where you went through the exhibit and you saw it's like 12 slides of him decaying from fresh corpse to wow. skull. Wow. And it's... It was in the summer, so it happened pretty quick. Um, you know, it doesn't take that long when it's hot sure. and humid and the bugs are out. Uh, but it's a fascinating thing, and you understand in the course of that presentation why it is so hard to identify a body after a certain point because they become unrecognizable. So there's a lot of science involved in that, and that's what Dr. Bass, of course, determined all this time since death science at the University of Tennessee. And if it interests you, you want me to come to a presentation, I can do that, contactbonezones.com. Or if you just want to read about it yourself on your own time, maybe get Death's Acre and Beyond the Body Farm, and then the fiction books, use that science that Dr. Bass would always be there as the scientific consultant while John Jefferson was writing this thriller of Daring Do, all mostly set, except for maybe there's like one book that's in Florida. Most of them are set right here in East Tennessee or Oak Ridge or somewhere around town with um, really well done. I mean, I enjoy reading those books because you can picture exactly where the characters are driving, you know, because that's how well John writes the books. So I recommend those at BoneZones.com. Don't forget the S. All right. Uh, so you did a series of videos with my friend Randy Thompson. Yes. Called State of Franklin. Yes. Now, as an outsider, as a newcomer, I didn't fully grasp the history of the State of Franklin until years later. But there was an attempt made to create uh, a state of the Union back in, I guess, when Tennessee was being formed from North Carolina. Right, right. There was a move and a governor and all of these things to create another state. It would have been the 17th, 16th state or 17th state um, called Franklin. Yes. So we would have had, you know, you just would have been like, you had Arkansas, you have Franklin, you have Tennessee. Right. And it would have been somewhere over middle Tennessee-ish? No, it, it's actually, it was East Tennessee. Oh, East Tennessee it, I, okay. I'm not sure if Knoxville would have been part of the state of Franklin or not, but it was definitely in this. Where region. John Sevier lived and all that. Maybe. I think so, right. possibly, yeah. He was the governor of it. Right. So you, that was, so it's a clever 
name. All right, so first of all, that gets you thinking, all right, what are we talking about? You're in Tennessee, which almost was the state of Franklin, named after none other than Benjamin Franklin. So now, and then the conceit of the show is something that has always fascinated me, this whole idea of what would our founding fathers think yes. of us? And, and the, of course, you solved that problem by making it time travel. Uh, yeah, and, and so the historical context of the actual state of Franklin has nothing to do it's just a with pun. it. It's just a name. Yeah. Um, so my wife and I are both huge Ben Franklin fans. Well, then you clearly uh, would agree that the greatest musical ever written about the Declaration of Independence is 1776. I wish I could agree. I've never seen it. <laughs> So I'm, I'm, it's ign cute. I'm ignorant in that respect. It's cute, and Ben Franklin is the best part of it, so I thought you might enjoy it. <laughs> I, and, and I probably would, because we're, we're huge fans. And we used to play this, when we still do, play this little game where if we see like an amazing piece of technology, we'll say, what would Ben Franklin yes. think of this? We're always having this discussion about what right. Ben Franklin... I can relate to that. And, and Ben would love it all, I'm sure. Yeah. But so I got the idea for this web series, and, and what it, it's I, I play the main character. Uh, my character's name was Toby Hamilton. I play a guy who's going through a divorce. His life is in turmoil. He's separated. His wife has taken up with another gentleman. Uh, we have a school-age daughter. You know, we, we're sharing custody. My wife is in turmoil. Mm. And then one day I come home, or I come home in the evening, to find that there is an explosion inside my living room. And I go inside, and there's a naked man <laughs> in my living room, baldish, shoulder length, straight shoulder-length hair. He says he's Ben Franklin, of course. Um, and it, it, it turns out to actually... B. Ben Franklin. Who was flying a kite and got struck by lightning. He was flying a kite, <laughs> got struck by lightning, and boom, he winds up in my living room. <laughs> he time traveled. Because I can make up whatever I want, right? Yes, it was so fun. And our friend Randy, who yeah. just happened to be uh, mostly bald with straight shoulder length yeah. hair. He has since cut his hair. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, he played Ben Franklin, and um, I loved it so much. And we had so much fun. It's it's a it's a sci-fi time travel buddy comedy. I watched the every as the episodes came out. I would watch them on the day they came. Oh, out. that's awesome! That's Thank how you. much I enjoyed them. And it, it would take me about a month to produce an, a ten-minute episode. I'd spend a week writing, yeah, and then we'd spend a week or a weekend shooting, wow. and then I'd spend another week editing and get, Yeah. So it I could, looked like a movie, I mean, or a TV show. It was really well done. And here, and I'll tell you what, it's still on YouTube, so. I'll put a link in the description, but go ahead. Go to us. a link and uh, you can subscribe. For free? <laughs> uh, no, it's, uh, it's actually 10, no, I'm kidding. it is, of course it's free. <laughs> subscribe, uh, if you, if you, Frank will put a link, but if yeah. you also wanted to just search yeah. YouTube, State of Franklin, comedy, look for my, you know, funny looking mug, and okay. uh, and you'll find you should find it. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, every now and then, I'll go back and I'll watch an episode, and I'll think, man, that was pretty good. It was very good. I, I was very, I was proud of it, and I just got, I got burned out on it, honestly, because that's that's a grind. Yeah. yeah, doing even just an episode a month just got to be. Well, I mean, it would, a grind. yeah, it would almost be you know, three months to take the way the amount of quality that's in it. It looked like it took longer than that. I was, you know, that you like you'd film for a year and then edit for a year and yeah. release them once a month. You know. Well, I'm glad it looked that. I'm glad it looked that good. I mean, it was a skeleton crew. It was the cast. I did. I shot. Well, we. I had some friends who also did some of the shooting. Because you're like Sam Comer, is he? Is Sa Sam did some sh uh, uh, shooting. Uh, 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 other people, yeah, yes. Other <laughs> I mean, people. what I mean is because you, Rob were, Simpson. That's when the name you're not in it, you can be the cameraman. But when you're in it, someone else right. has to be. Right, and I'm directing, and mm -hmm. I'm writing, and editing, nice. and all that. And it just really got to. It just got to be a lot. But we had so much fun. Um, yeah, check it out. It's uh, and I like uh, but it. And, I, and and sometimes I still think, well, maybe because it's a with a time travel story, you can do anything. Like it's yeah. been it's been ten years, but I have moved. Oh. Uh, my hair is a little grayer. Yeah. Randy has cut his hair. The the girl who played my daughter, I think, is in college now. Oh wow! But I could probably still. You could make an episode if, of Jumping Ahead. If you, yeah, if you're doing time warp stories, you could <laughs> you could make you could work with that. So that's who knows? fun. All right. So you were going to ask me though about improv, which is something that uh, I am passionate about. In fact, right. you asked when I when you said that you rec knew me from when I first moved here. My thought was, oh, because he's in acting and arts, he probably saw me do Einstein Simplified, which I joined that troupe uh, two months, um, no, what, one month after I moved here. Okay. I mean, I, my first day on the air with Phil was May 1st, 2002. 
I auditioned for Einstein Simplified on June 1st, 2002. Wow, okay. So that's something that's been uh, part of my uh, Knoxville DNA for 20 sure. years. Sure, and, and I got to know you that way later. Okay. Um, but I, and one thing we haven't talked about, and we can get into this, maybe yeah. this may be a whole nother episode, Ooh. but uh, my, my first career was in stand-up comedy. Mm -hmm. Uh, I did that uh, really straight out of college, and the, you know, well, pretty much all of my twenties. I am a huge fan of comedy, improv, and stand up. So I, I, I always, I was a, I considered myself a, a competent, yeah, stand up comic. Uh, I, I made a living at it. I mean, that mm -hmm. was my full time job for for almost seven years. But when it comes to improv, I, I have tried to do improv, Frank, and I just, it's a train wreck. Mm -hmm. They're very different skill sets. Very. And I, I've, I've talked about this, actually, um, not on this show, but I've, I wrote an essay one time trying to explain to broadcasters the difference between stand-up and improv. Yes. Because especially the, the bosses in radio and in broadcasting, they do not understand anything about comedy. They think that your t radio morning show, which is four and a half hours a day, five days a week, should be as good and as polished as the late night monologue that they saw, uh, you know, at the time when I was working in LA, it would be Jay Leno or sure. or Jimmy Kim or David Letterman, but now it would be Kimmel or uh, Fallon or whomever. Right. They think that your radio morning show should be as polished as that. I'm like, you don't understand that to write a 15 second joke, or you have to have basically start. I, I use 15 as an easy analogy. You start with this idea, this story that may take 15 minutes. You keep whittling it down and boiling it down and boiling it down until you get this little drop, this crystallized drop. Right. It's a reduction. You're making a sauce, and you're constantly reducing and reducing and reducing until you get this delicious, pun tasty, you know, strong tasting joke with a uh, setup and a premise and a punchline. You know, a premise, a pattern, and a punchline, um, and you have it. Right. But that's one. So now you've filled 15 seconds of your set. Yeah, yeah. So you have to do that over and over again. And these takes, so it takes hours of thought and ideas to fill up, bup, 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 bup. Uh, you get a three minutes and maybe you can be a, a MC. You get six minutes and maybe you can be an opener. You get to like 12, maybe you can, 18, right. maybe you can be a middler. Right. And then finally, you know, once you get into the 30, 45 minute range, you're a headliner. Sure. So you were a headliner? Uh, no, I was, um, I was a strong middle act. Uh -huh. uh, my act was usually about 30 minutes. So you opened um, for some, like locally, some of the big names would come through here to go to Side Splitters or the Comedy Zone Well, I that. was not. I was based in Nashville at the time. I, oh, I, they I, have I, good clubs there. Yeah, I was actually, the summer after my junior year in college mm -hmm. is when Zany's yeah. uh, at Comedy Club, which is it, still there, the the comedy club, well, not the only, but it's like the major well, comedy club. Well, when you club. watch like uh, Nate Bargatze's YouTube channel, he's, he's been giving exposure to these young guys using Nate Bargatze's name and fame to put the guys on his crew mm -hmm. and there are his opening acts or whomever. But there's always, it seems like it's always at Zany's. Like here's yeah. 15 minutes of some new guy at Zany's, but Nate Bargatze opens it and closes it and is putting his stamp of approval on right. the guy. Right, I've seen those shows that yeah. he does. And um, so I was in Nashville when Zany's opened and that fall they started doing open mic night. So I'm, I'm in uh, fall term of my senior year in college and I'm going up and doing open mic nights. And the uh, first two nights I went up was just abysmal. <laughs> But uh, the third week I went up, I got big, big laughs, and you know was bitten by the, oh, the stand-up yeah. bug. Yeah, yeah. And then, and within two years, I was, uh, I was, I transitioned from working as a server in a restaurant to being on the road full time. Whoa! So who are some of the guys that you were on the same bill with? You know, because you end up if you're on the road, you may end up staying in the comedy condo yeah. with them, which is a disgusting. Um, <laughs> Yeah. It's, it's as gross as it sounds. Yeah, Rather it's, than it's, pay hotel rooms for these people, the, the uh, comedy clubs will own a condominium walking distance from the club, and they'll put all they'll throw all the comedians in there, and you're on your own. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Right? yeah. Imagine having two new roommates every week. Oh. That's, it was, but uh, I, I worked with a lot of guys who were like myself, up and coming back then, but many many of which have have gone on to huge yeah. things. Yeah. Um, I, I, let me just. Here's one for example. Right. Uh, th this is late '80s, early '90s. I think around 1988. I worked. Uh, I was still living in Nashville, but I worked. Uh, what do you, uh, you don't remember the Funny Bone Comedy Club that used to be in Knoxville? Um, no, but I, I, I'm familiar. I've heard of yeah several of these. I think they might have had one in uh, some other cities. Too. They they did, and right. it was a full time comedy club. It was I, I was in D.C. at that time, so yes. we were going to whatever the club was downtown. 
you know, on M Street, but go ahead. But this was on uh, Kingston Pike, yeah. and, and I was uh, working as a feature act uh, that week, and the headliner was Drew Carey. Oh, so, wow. And, and Drew Carey was, he was a pretty well-known headliner, but he had not had his TV show yet. He was not a household name. But he would be on late-night talk shows, and he'd be, he'd yeah. recognize, that would be his credit. Oh, you've yes. seen him on Johnny Carson. He had done Carson and, yeah. and, and Letterman and all of that. But I, I worked with him in, a, in, a, in an opening act who I happen to actually still be Facebook friends with. But after three nights, uh, the club owner fired Drew because he was not getting any laughs. No way! He, they, fought, they let him go, and they brought in Coincidentally, uh, Ron White, who was part of Jeff Foxworthy's blue collar comedy. Very tour. Southern. Right. Uh, and of course, Ron White went over yeah. greatly in Knoxville, as you yeah. can imagine. But Drew just didn't connect with the audiences. To um, Cleveland? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and I remember we, we went up to, uh, we went to see a movie one yeah. day, me and Drew and the other guy. And it was just, that's just some of the, yeah. the comedy thing you, you did, go out time, to see the movie. You got time during the day to kill, right? Um, but um, yeah, that was, I felt bad for him. But, oh, uh, wow. Wow. I, I'm a fan of stand-up. I worked at a radio network that was called the Comedy World Radio Network. And they, the idea, they, they burned through the money, so f all of the, in, um, the investment capital, they burned through it so fast that it went bankrupt. Um, and it was mostly the executives. They weren't, it wasn't, they were paying, I mean, well, they did overpay the staff too, which I was fine with me. But we had uh, a whole lineup, imagine, of stand up comedians trying to do, in effect, morning radio shows around the clock. So we had um, this Big Daddy Jeff Wayne, we had Alan Havey, we had uh, Ken Ober, Bobby Slayton, Sue Murphy. Um, we had some more of these alternative comics like uh, Beth Lapidus um, had a midday shift. So it was all sorts of different types of comedy. And those are just the, the ones off the top of my head that I would remember seeing every day when I would go to work. Um, but a lot of them didn't get the they had writers. We had, we had a comedian, they'd have a, a writer and a producer on the show. It was a huge staff. I guess I mean, they said they burned through the money remarkably fast. But um, the concept they had of trying to write in advance the script that they were going to say on the radio, it was very difficult for them. And I'm a radio guy. So when I got a weekend shift, they had, nobody wanted the Saturday morning shift. And I asked for it and I got it. And, but I got it on a trial basis. They said, well, we don't know if you can do it. We'll give you two weeks to see if you, or maybe three weeks to see if you can do it. After the first one, the guy says to me, uh, forget the audition, you've got the show, it's yours. And he also said, I don't know how you make it seem so easy. Everyone else is struggling with it. Hmm. I said, because they're trying to write the show in advance and anticipate everything. It's not, it's not stand up, yep, it's yep, improv. Yep. It's completely the opposite arrangement. And an improv, instead of trying to take this idea and boil it down, boil it down, reduce, reduce, you start with the tiniest a suggestion. You start with the seed yes. and you grow it, grow it, grow it. And when you, the audience laughs and you get the funny, then you're done. Okay, moving on. Next. And the audience is very forgiving uh, because it's their seed, their idea. Right, right. So they want to see where it goes and they want you to grow it and make it funny. Um, so uh, that's why in an improv show I learned, over, at least here in Knoxville, maybe it's like this everywhere, you get a lot of the same audience over and over again to see different material every time. They never see the same show twice, but you get a lot of a loyal repeat audience. At stand-up, why would you see the same comedian twice? You, if you went, if there were two shows at uh, let's seven and nine, you would see the exact same jokes that Drew Carey would deliver the exact same monologue at every show yeah. with a, a tiny variation here or there, but the, generally speaking, you've polished the act, right? Right, right. And you do the same act. That's why you have to go to city to city because you got to find you got to find a new audience. They're not coming back to you, right? And a good a good working comic that you'll go to see in a club has spent years perfecting that those you know trial and error, trial yeah. and error, constant. Now, has every you, syllable counts. Yes, you know? absolutely. Yeah. Have you done stand up as we're defining it? Yes. Okay. Um, there was a contest at Side Splitters Comedy Club, and it was called Host with the Most. And the idea was that they would get people who were not comedians to get on stage and attempt comedy to win money mm -hmm. for a charity. And they did this in a couple of different ways. Like there was a version of it where all the open mic comics could compete and the winner, who was this um, guy named Nate Kate, uh, would get to go have a... Do you remember Nate? No. <laughs> he was in a wheelchair. He's hilarious. Okay. Um, no. 
He was, uh, I haven't talked to him in years. I wish I knew where he was. I just like the name, Nate Kate. Yeah, what a great I lo- name. I, I love, I love What him. a great name. So he would, he won and he would, went down to Tampa and he, was, he got to get a paid gig at their club in Tampa for a weekend. Well, anyway, this is the same concept, except it was guys from WIMZ and um, with their sister station, 94, whatever it was. Um, you had a couple of TV people. You had a couple of newspaper guys, um, you know, men and women radio and television and newspaper mainly, who were local celebrities and all competing to be the host with the most. Okay. So I didn't enter the first year because I thought, well, I don't do stand-up. And the lady who were in the club, she said, but uh, she knew I did improv. She said, you'd be great at this. I'm like, yeah, it's the opposite. There's this triangle and you see you're reducing and then you're growing and, the, and she didn't care about that. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I went to the event. In fact, remember Taz Cable? We talked about him right yes, before we sat yes, down. Yes, yes. I don't know what made me think of him, but something made me think of Taz Cable and you know who I'm talking about. He was competing that year. Okay. So he says, come, and I bought, bought my ticket through him so he would get the credit toward the fundraising competition and maybe win. And Taz, I've, I've written this chapter in my memoir. I don't know, you obviously you haven't read it yet because I haven't finished the memoir, but I'll say it here. I wanted to vote for Taz, I really did. Uh, but ta- he bombed that night. Mm. He just bombed. And uh, this guy who I didn't know named Mike Howard, who I'm now I'm friends with, cause, but he killed. He, and uh, Mike Howard apparently had done uh, stand-up out in California, but he was a, definitely a radio guy. He was had a talk show and does local acting, he works at Dollywood now as a stage manager. I mean, you probably, you, he ran Encore Theatrical for a little while. You would know who I'm talking about if you saw him probably. Okay. Um, and I voted for Mike Howard because he was the best one. So he, uh, I think he won and Taz did not. I never told Taz uh, until <clears throat> now that I didn't vote for him, but <laughs> I love you Taz. I, I, you've taught me a lot over the years and one of the things was how, what not to do. <laughs> yeah. So I didn't want to do it. Well, anyway, it comes around a year. And she, Bridget, the lady at this comedy club, is asking me to do it again. And I had, having seen how it went, the, the, I, it's in the back of my mind that I probably could. I mm-hmm. probably could. Yeah, I'm not, I, I, maybe I'd have to work at it. I can't just go and just do it. I mean, I, I'd be, I, I could try. I mean, I could wing it. I could do my impersonation of someone doing stand-up. But why don't I, tr- anyway, I signed up. Went through this whole rigmarole and I signed up. Um, and I... Rather than just show up that night, I went to open mic night and was terrible. So yeah, that's fine. I went back to the next open mic night and I was terrible again. And somebody came up to me, one of the other comedians came up to me and says, you know, there's this book about how to do stand up. It's written by this lady named Judy Carter. And it's a workshop, it's a book. I mean, some people like it, some people don't, but it's, a, it's at least give you some basics of how to do stand up comedy. And that's where I learned, you know, oh, okay, you've got to do something called an act out. You've got to do something, uh, you know, basic um, premise, pattern, break the pattern, bump, bump, bum. You know, there's sort of these things and kind of reduce and boil down and don't get into your, get out of your own head with talking about these stories that are interesting just to you and make it more accessible to everybody else. So I, are, so I started getting ba- better at it. And I've been going now to open mic nights for probably three months leading up to the contest. Okay. Now, I noticed none of the other contestants were doing that. <laughs> I was just, it was just yeah. me and, and all the regular open mic guys. Sure. But I, I practiced. And the other conceit to win the contest was to sell the most tickets. You know, you, you get a prize for your charity, gets a prize if you sell the most tickets. And if you get the most votes the night of, you get 90% of the door. And the other 10% is doled out to everybody else, okay. right? Okay. So I decided I'm going to take it all. I'm taking, maybe it was 80% that I, somehow I got 90% because I got the 10% for selling the most tickets and whatever the rest of it was for when it, getting the most votes. So I go to my church, which is nearby on Cedar Bluff Road, and I'm telling everybody I'm going to be raising money for Catholic charities. You want to raise money for Catholic charities? There's $10. Come on out. We're having a fundraiser for Catholic charities. And the priest is there sitting with my wife at the main, we're at, we bought the, we bought our own tickets and I know the club, we were doing improv at the club at the time. I knew exactly what table to get. I wanted to get one where she could record me. So I got the best, you know, right there. But also it meant that all the comedians are looking at the priest. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it destroyed them. Oh, I can imagine. Yeah. It messed with their heads. It got in their heads. Because they, a lot of those guys had filthy acts. Because when you start out in comedy and you, and my act had curse words in it at the beginning, I didn't know 
I ended up taking them all out and making it a clean act, which is harder because yes. you can get on there and say filthy words and you'll get a reaction from the audience. You could shock them into laughing. That's right. a lot of comedians. Gilbert Gottfried would used to do that. He'd come out and do his filthiest stuff right at the beginning, kind of shock you into submission. And then he would do his regular material, which was hilarious. A lot of, that's a technique. Well, I decided I was going to go clean on this because, I mean, obviously I'm playing for Catholic Charities and the priest is going to be there. But these other guys, they just, I mean, they were all off their game. Uh -huh. And then I come out there and I start doing jokes about my, my beloved Irish Catholic parents who drank too much. And everyone in the audience is like, oh, I can relate to that. Yeah. <laughs> so, of course... I won. <laughs> you were prepared. You're pre you had you you rigged the game. You were yes, prepared. Yeah, totally. You were, you, that's great. <laughs> I, I have to I have to tell you though. I I have always been um, uh, in awe and just uh, very humbled by uh, anybody who is good at improv. Because I've seen Einstein simplified. I've seen and uh, full disclosure when, yeah, when they were good. doing a lot of stuff. And uh, full disclosure was hosting. Workshops. Monthly they they workshops. did the other style of improv. I didn't get into that. They did long form. Is, yeah, they, and, and we do short form, which right. is it's. It, you could say it's long form in a short period, but it's more gamey and jokey, like on whose line. Right. You see, whose line is it anyway? That's short form. Right. And long form. That's like they're trying to create a story arc with a beginning, right. middle, and an end. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I go to those workshops mm -hmm. and. I, I think my problem, maybe I, I, I was in too much in my own head. I was trying to think it too much instead of just going with the yeah. situation i was trying to like kind of pre-write things you know because that's what stand-up comics do sure. they pre-write and um well, I, I, maybe you're a generator see and, and i'm a reactor okay and if you can that's one thing i mean it's like i guess it's a personality type but in a talk show scenario um in a morning dj show they, they had workshops we have to figure out who's on the show is the generator and who's the reactor huh. and they always said it's easier to be the reactor and i'm like okay well then i'll take the easy one but if you're, it's hard to be a good generator. It sounds like that's what you were doing, though. You were trying to generate where it's going, whereas a reactor like me can walk into an improv scene and just with nothing, and you just see something, and then you react to it. Okay. Yeah. I'd never heard those terms. That's interesting. I, I, I would love to uh, learn. I would love to be in an improv learning environment because it's something I, I, I'm, I, I still want to challenge myself to yeah. be not sucky at. Well, I loved it. I mean, to me, it's it's. I mean, it's it's spiritual in the regard that when you're doing improv, the most important person on the stage is the other person. Right. So it's the golden rule, you know, uh, love your neighbor as yourself, or something. In this case, be, support your neighbor more, mm -hmm. and they should do the same for you. Um, it is the all the act of listening. Yes, that helps and you. Mm -hmm. yes, the accepting ending. and advancing. So it's yeah, this it's skills that um, help you in life beyond the stage, but if you can do it on stage and, and just, it's very freeing. The other thing I like about it is, you know, I don't know if you have one of those voices inside your head, it sounds like you do, that's constantly trying to tell you what to do and tell you everything and so all these When I'm doing improv, those voices are silenced because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm too, it's one of those activities that I'm 100% involved in the moment. All I can do is be in the pretend scene. Everything in the improv is fake, of course. It's just imaginary. There's no, I'm not really holding a pineapple, but you can think that I am. Um, all of that is pretend, and I'm so engrossed in that made-up world for two, three, four, five minutes that every other worry I have in the world goes away. Yeah, that's got to be quite a rush. Yeah. I, I, and, and it's like, I, I have always considered myself a fairly quick-witted person i can yeah. sit here and you know riff with you and blah 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 i agree but if you, but if somebody says okay mitch um you're a pig and it's saint patrick's day go <laughs> and i'm like i don't know what to do with that what what <laughs> what do i do so i don't know <laughs> when porky's eyes are smiling <laughs> see there you go that, there you go that's it that's it you're doing well, all right. it so there's another uh, technique that i tried to teach some radio djs it's it, they said look if you have to make comedy on the spot um and you just you've got two things that are seem unassociated make a list of of qualities of the two things right things that you associate with irish right things that you associate with pigs mm -hmm. and porky pig comes up and irish eyes are smiling come up and those aren't a perfect match but they were near the top of the list in my head so i just did one with it right right that's that's <laughs> that's 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 how it works isn't yeah it? That's, that's yeah how it but works. i mean we in in radio you've got more time you can actually plot out and it's always you know oh they're gonna open a new theme park based on 
whatever. It seems like that was a, a standard trope in the 80s and 90s. So you write down all the theme park things, all the rides at Disneyland and other theme parks, and then you write down the other weird characters that, oh, if there's going to be a theme park based on other character, not Mickey Mouse. And then all, you just start filling, matching, and you know, connecting the dots, and you've got this you know, radio bit in yeah. fairly short order. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you. Uh, thank you. You may. I, I appreciate all the compliments, and I return them to you because uh, I'm a fan of your writing, and obviously with State of Franklin, and uh, your acting that I've seen. I haven't seen you do that in a while, but I'm, uh, I'm. And I'm glad. I didn't know that you did so much writing. That's good to know that you have yeah, an actual yeah, income. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. For now. For now. And I'm also glad that I uh, uh, got off my sorry. Uh, but and uh, and got you over here. Yeah, me too. This I've been I have been uh, look I've been looking forward to this all week. I've been really psyched Good. for it. So, all right, yeah. well, excellent. Well, if you enjoy Audible Entertainment, no, as in Audible specifically, I go to audibletrial.com slash show where they've got a gazillion. I think they said three hundred years worth of audiobooks. So you can't physically listen to them all, but. You can start somewhere and listen to the ones that you really want to hear. And in fact, if you go to that uh, URL, you get a free premium membership for one month where you get an MP3 download. You can also listen to as much streaming as you can during that month and make a decision at the end and stick with it, as you probably will. Continue to get an MP3 credit every month thereafter. And those are the ones you download and keep on your own device so that if you're somewhere without a connection, you're in a plane, you're in a mountains, whatever, you can listen to what you've downloaded. But it's not just audiobooks, it's podcasts like ours at audibletrial.com slash show. We also urge you to check out the merch, uh, like the, the, the mug, the new mug. Uh, next week, I hope to have the pint glasses, maybe a new hoodie to show you. Um, here's the old hoodie, which uh, my friend Becca bought one. We had a merch oh, wow. sale. So she bought this in blue, and I forgot to ask her if she got the royal blue, which is, I think, very pretty. Or, yeah, I can um, see that. And the other one, there's another one that my wife has. I'll have to show it to you, uh, but it's got the old logo on it, but it's super soft. So I ordered her one of those for her birthday. In fact, oh, I might be showing this episode on her birthday. <laughs> Happy birthday, Jerry. <laughs> 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 Just occurred to me, well, cal- calendar, if I put this out on Friday, uh, happy birthday, yeah, Jerry. Yeah. I, <laughs> I was thinking of you. Um, and you get the merch at uh, frankandfriendsshow.com slash store. Uh, you can subscribe for free on YouTube. It does not cost. Please do check that out. Uh, and you can also listen on all the audio podcast devices. Mitch, I'll put the link for State of Franklin in the uh, in the credits, anything Thank else you. you want to plug, or you just want to come back sometime? Let's just. Uh, I would just like to come back sometime, and we'll tell more stories. Tell more stories. Good. I'll, I'll be like one of those uh, um, old showbiz guys with a scar. Yeah. But when uh, yes. me and Frank came out of the Copa, yeah. we ran into Sammy and oh, Dean. Yeah. And, you know, I don't. I, no, I don't want to be. Don't want to be that guy. But <laughs> actually, if you look up Frank and Friends on YouTube, and you don't put Frank and Friends show. The first hits are all Sinatra and uh, Sammy uh, Davis Jr. Okay, yeah. So it's a good company to be in. Of course, yeah. All right. All right, well, this is the Frank and French Show. Thanks for watching. My name is Frank Murphy. I'm Mitch Moore. And we'll talk to you again next time.